The concept of DNA transfer, we've been talking about it as a field of forensics since RFLP, when you needed a lot of DNA to get any sort of um, uh, profile, right? Well, now our technology is so much more sensitive and so much better with the SDRs and the YSTRs, you need very little DNA to, to get a profile. And so transfer is a huge issue. Um, it's imperative for, for you to decide in your case, what's the reality? You have to look at the amount of DNA, DNA that is there, that is in your case, the quantity of DNA, and is that, does that go with the defense hypothesis? My client's hypothesis, what my client is saying to me, or does that go with the prosecution's hypothesis? And I assure you, the crime lab is always going to pick the prosecution hypothesis. So what the American Academy of Forensic Science is saying, let's go with the Bayesian theory. It's a, it's a statistical theory. Um, and it's kind of a nice little theory. And this is something that I've used in a couple cases. And it succeeded twice, got denied once. But the jury can understand it. On the right, on the blue side, is the prosecution's hypothesis. The orange side is the um, defense hypothesis. And what of the factual evidence in the case fits where in that chart? So for example, the, the prosecution is saying, Mr. Smith digitally penetrated Ms. Jones. And we're saying that, look, Ms. Smith and Ms. Jones live together. They share the same environment. So we, we, the defense considers transfer and living in social environment, and the prosecution considers, their consideration of their hypothesis is that uh, it, the vagina is a DNA-rich environment to get the DNA from friction and force through digital penetration, leaving skin cells. So if, for example, the prosecution's hypothesis leans towards being correct or valid or statistically more probable than the, the defense's hypothesis, you would see a high amount of DNA recovered and a good quality DNA profile. You would see matching person of interest you would see a single source sample being developed, and you'd see a full DNA profile. Maybe a major, minor, but very, but both profiles are being able to be developed and seen, not partial profiles. That is if the prosecution theory is more probable than not under the Bayesian theorem that, that the prosecution's theory is more correct than what the defense is proposing or hypothesizing. In the defense, it's the opposite. You would look and see there's a low amount of DNA, and it's poor quality DNA. The non-matching or matching doesn't really matter in a transfer case, uh, but it would most likely be a DNA mixture. And then it would also be a partial DNA profile or a complex mixture that may not be able to be completely deconvoluted. If, if, if you can't use that demonstrative, but you'd like to try, call me, I'll get it to you. That demonstrative, just by the way, is taken straight out of the American Academy. So if they say, oh, if the expert, the witness from the government says, oh, I, I don't know where you got that. Well, it came from your association. You can use a, if you can't use a demonstrative board or exhibit, like that one I showed you, you usually can get it out through using a dry erase board and talking through, you've got the little sheet, and talk through all of it and make the, if it actually goes with your, your theory, if it's a high, uh, the defense hypothesis and it, and it goes towards, I wouldn't do it if it's the prosecution one, but, um, but you guys have the law degrees. Um, so you could do that with the expert, go through it to make the jury understand that it really doesn't make sense if their hypothesis is correct, why do we have such a low profile? 
Why do we have a partial profile? Why can't it be deconvoluted? Why is the quant so low? So you can go through it that way. Um, you have to recognize in every single one of these cases, there is a river of reinforcement that begins when the child makes the allegation against whoever it is, talks to the next person, talks to the next person, gets into the forensic interview. We have to just accept that as a bad fact that we have to deal with. That, and the forensic interview was part of this because that process, we all know because we've seen them, does reinforce what that child says happened. It's not questioned, it's not dissected in a way that, quite frankly, we would like allegations to be dissected. <laughs> um, so the forensic interview is part of this, is part of this river of reinforcement. And it can, it can either create or reinforce these false, these mistaken, these um, incorrect statements that are made. We were talking about this internally and we were thinking about it like this, right? In your investigations, in your case investigations, once the forensic interview happens, then it's kind of like in the can, right? It's done. You know, it's the disclosures have been made, the police have done their investigation, the, the forensic interview takes place, and then it's like hermetically sealed in terms of anything else being, you know, relevant to this discussion. And we were saying, you know, Far from the kind of, this is the objective questioning technique that produces the truth, way they present forensic interviews at trials. I mean, they, the prosecution. What it really is for them is just kind of the, the thing they gotta get to get the conviction, right? Once the forensic interview is in the can, we're on our way. And at their seminars, right, I don't think they're talking about the forensic interview process as this truth-seeking objective process. I think they're talking about it like the thing that you gotta get that helps you get a conviction, right? That this is the thing that they've come up with over the last 30 years since John Yeel invented the, or came up with the stepwise approach. And once we do that and we engage a good CPS um, worker or investigator to engage the forensic interview process, we're done, we're home. We're you know, three quarters of the way to guilty. We were doing research, Apo research on an expert witness once recently, and one of her presentation seminars was how to be convincing in front of a jury, right? That was, and she was a child forensic interviewer, right? And so we crossed her on that a little bit, but they're training on this, not in a way that's about truth seeking, but in a way that's about conviction seeking. So the preliminary questions in a forensic interview that you, you just really every single time, right? You have to look at whether it was recorded, whether the interview um, you know, produced an audio or video. You guys all have video of these now, right? Is there any place where you don't? And how many of you have statutes for admission? Do your states have statutes that are kind of a prerequisite for admitting a forensic interview of a child under a certain age? We deal with this in Wisconsin. Just curious, it's more of a distraction. Um, you know, I mean, the, it, it is a practical matter. Most of them fit in Wisconsin. They meet the criteria because they're trained to meet the criteria in the interview, right? Um, but you have to look at, you know, what information around disclosure was used, what methodology was used, what methodology was followed. So we always subpoena the DA's, well, I usually just email the DA and say, look, what was the guideline that was used by the interviewer in this case? Sometimes now more recently, Kathy, I don't know if you've dealt with this recently, but we've been redirected to the Department of Justice in Wisconsin for the for Wisconsin Forensic Guidelines and which edition, and we have to get that so that we can cross our interviewer, right? And then looking at whether that methodology was adapted or changed. Now, the forensic interview process it's all the same, right? We're dealing with this same basic structure in all the states that we practice in, right? And so in your written materials, we've included a full copy of the APSAC guidelines. That's the American Professional Society for the Abuse of Children. And their guidelines are kind of the national standard. And for example, in our state, we have the Wisconsin Forensic Interview Guidelines, which are basically these. I don't think there's really any if, uh, uh, significant adaptations, but they call them the Wisconsin Forensic Interview Guidelines, perhaps to be more convincing in front of juries. I don't know. But all of our experts know and reference the APSAC guidelines. They're usually members of APSAC, the interviewers are. And so reading those guidelines in your materials, pulling them down, figuring out what your interviewer used, and then being proficient in speaking that language, we think is, is, is a requirement. And they all have the same basic parts, right? The interviewer introduces themselves, explains some few basic ground rules. Does this sound familiar, you guys? 
Then there's a little bit of, you know, establishing of rapport. There's testing the child to see if they can, you know, give a narrative event. Kind of like, what did you do when you woke up this morning? Did you get dressed? Can you tell me all about that? Um, exploring the difference between the truth and a lie. Ridiculous examples like, if somebody said my shoe was green and the shoe is purple in the video, would that be a truth or a lie? That would be a lie. Thank you. As if that provides some context in imparting upon the child the importance of not telling a lie when accusing their stepfather of touching their penis, right? It's just the same. Um, and then um, promise or <laughs> promise, or if the child is old enough in Wisconsin, I think it's 12 or older, to oath to tell the truth. And then getting around to introducing the topic of concern, which for forensic interviewers means, tell me all about when your stepfather touched you, but I can't say it that way, so I've got to figure out a way to introduce the topic of concern. And then there is a series of questions that are asked by the interviewer, and they're supposed to do this in a very particular way. That's the basic structure. So what we have found, what I do, what we do in every case, um, and I'm sure most of you do this as well, is you got to do a transcript, have a transcript done of these interviews. It's, it's crucial. Um, use a service, use your secretary, whatever it is. Have a transcript made and make sure that that transcript is, um, is sent over to the prosecution and that they are in agreement with it so that obviously you can use it at the trial. Staying with phones, I do want to make a quick point that when you lock and unlock your phone, that you are not just unlocking and un locking your phone. You are actually, whether you know it or not, decrypting and unencrypting your phone. The phone companies for years have set this up so that we don't know it, and it's great, actually, because what it does is it takes plain text, and when you lock it, converts it to what they call cipher text, plain text being readable, cipher text being unreadable. And when when that happens, and how that happens, I don't know. That's way beyond me. I don't know how they do that, so don't, don't ask me, okay? But this is important because judges like to say this is like unlocking a box. It's not like unlocking a box. It's like unlocking a box and then translating all of the contents. And that's a distinction to the Fourth Amendment that I, that I just wanna, I wanna raise. Okay, so we're gonna talk about staying with phones, What's a Fifth Amendment violation? What do we need? We need it to be compelled. We need it to be testimonial. We need it to be self-incriminating because no person shall be compelled in the criminal case to be a witness against himself or herself. So when we look at opening these, these little babies, it falls under a couple of different categories, right? Passcodes, facial IDs, biometric locks. Very, very simply. A uh, biometric lock would be like a thumbprint. Facial ID would be like I hold it up and hopefully it recognizes me and lets me in. And a passcode or a password is just, as you can see in that slide on the left, the contents of your mind. And this is analyzed differently as a result of how uh, these, uh, these different uh, locks are used. So the contents of your mind, and here's a string site, should be protected. Generally, the courts are protecting an alphanumeric passcode that reveals the contents of your mind under the Fifth Amendment. And there's a whole a string set of cases. It's all in your materials. You don't have to, to, uh, to write it down. And how about this, then? If it reveals the contents of your mind and you're in trial and the cop takes the stand and says, yeah, you didn't give, give the passcode, isn't that a Fifth Amendment violation? I think it is. Utah thought it was. So, you know, just keep that in mind that if these are testimonial and they fall under the Fifth Amendment, then within the meaning of the Fifth Amendment that there are arguments there even at trial. Um, this is just piling on some more. When a defendant, whether a defendant can be compelled to disclose a password to allow Pennsylvania to access his lawfully seized but encrypted computer, we find that compulsion is violative of the Fifth Amendment Prohibition against self-incrimination. Yeah, that's right. We're going to talk more about that case in a second. Okay, now, but back on to, let me see, I missed a slide here. Oh, yeah. Also, keep in mind when we're talking about whether or not it's testimonial, that, um, that there, are, is other, there are other arguments to make there. Because it, when, when I unlock my phone, 
for the police, I'm also telling them that I have the ability to control that phone, right? I'm, I'm t it is an act of production in itself. And so as a result, and, and, and as this case says, it's incriminating to effectively concede the existence, possession, control, and authenticity of the potentially incriminating device. Yeah, because they're there saying this thing contains contraband. So if I say, sure, I'm opening it up, I think, sure, it's testimonial. But then we look at facial IDs and biometric locks, and they're a lot less likely to be protected. A lot less likely. The bottom line is if an expert comes to you and says your client is pedophilic, don't see it as the kiss of death. We have actually have a lot of cases where we've been very successful in mitigating at sentencing, even with a pedophilic diagnosis. And what we have found is that a lot of the judges appreciate the honesty and transparency of how, this is how we've arrived at this decision. And even though the client is pedophilic, let me help you understand what could happen or what we could do with this client. We do things like sexual interest testing. Hopefully you're a little bit familiar with ABLE assessments. Uh, ABLE, and then there are also tests called the Affinity and the Look. They all do the same thing. They all are assessing for kind of age categories and gender categories of individuals. Penile plethysmograph is the placing of the uh, strain gauge around the penis and showing them images and having them listen to. Uh, stories about having sex with different age people. Uh, different scenarios. We don't typically do PPGs, uh, but it is something that can be done. And then we have other instruments like the CASIC, which is a pedophilic predictor instrument that we can use to help. Uh, and what we're looking for is no single piece of data is going to be helpful. What we're looking for is the intersection of data, right, where we can see a lot of things come together and be able to then tie it to our own clinical expertise and make uh, an evaluation. Polygraphs, we have a lot of cases now that people want polygraphs, especially for child pornography only offenders, to say, do you have a, a past contact sexual offense? That's what they're interested in. Prosecutors or law enforcement are interested in. There's a new, uh, it's not called lie detection now, it's called truth verification, right? So we're doing all, this, uh, all these language changes. But there's a new truth verification system called the iDetect. On that web page that I gave you, there's information about the lie detect. The eye detect uh, can be very helpful uh, in these cases. And typically, we conduct the polygraphs. We don't conduct them. We refer them outside of us so that you can let us know if we should know about them or not. <laughs> um, in general, large, when we look at large groups of child pornography offenders, their offense recidivism rate is about two to six percent. Do you know what the recidivism rate is typically for contact offenders? The most commonly accepted statistics are about 13 to 17 percent. So when you're starting out with a child pornography offender and only not contact offender, they're already coming in at two to six percent, which is less than half of the recidivism rate of a contact offender. Okay. Now, once you add that they've had an offense or they have a violent offense or something, that rate goes up, right? So we're just talking about the CP-only offenders. We have something called the Child Abuse Material Inventory. I stopped in a little bit earlier today and heard one of the previous speakers talking a little bit about what do you do with forensic data. We have a tool called the CAMI that inventories forensic data so that we can kind of know what we need to know about the client based on the discovery. Okay. The CAMI is on the web page. It's a free tool. Feel free to download it. Give it to your investigators in your office, or if there's a forensic examiner that you've hired, use the CAMI to kind of help because we've based it on the risk thing. So for example, a lot of times they'll say they had 3,000 images of child pornography. And we'll say, and how many images of adult pornography? And they'll say, well, we didn't pay attention to that. right? The ratio of child pornography to adult pornography is an important thing to pay attention to, right? If they have 3,000 child images and 50,000 adults is a lot different than 3,000 child and 100 adult, right? So those are the kinds of questions the CAMI helps us get answers to based on the forensic.